Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, how's everybody doing today? All good? Having a good time so far? Awesome. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me quickly introduce myself. So um, I started off my career in industrial design, um, designing things like this, furniture, appliances, gadgets, electronics, all the fun stuff. And then I fell in love with human-computer interactions, started to uh, build software, um, designing attractive products, services, tools, and systems. And I have a little bit of an um, also like history working uh, on um, apps, multiple apps, services, and tech and startup world. So I first started in um, Swarm and Foursquare. Are you guys familiar with uh, these apps? So like Swarm is a social app where you check in and share a location with your friends. And then Foursquare is um, a discovery. Um, Discovery search engine for places. So yeah, I was um, working on those products back in New York, and last year I moved to uh, Berlin to work at Wunderlist that I acquired by Microsoft later on. And actually, this is uh, quite fresh news for you guys too. Uh, I moved to Envision uh, last week, so now I'm working at Envision. So any feedback, any future requests, please come find me. products um, deliver good experiences for our users um, in a very like agile speed manner uh, but today I want to focus on um, in the next 40 minutes or so I want to focus on how design ethics can come in many forms from how you create your company how you create your team uh, how to um, spread the love for doing the right thing for yourself for your team for your users and uh, we will talk about these like ethical choices uh, and embracing these like methods that are value driven. Um, and obviously we will discuss how our brains are reacting to all these things, how we um, bias, how we have biases towards creativity and how we can kill it as an organization. Uh, so we're gonna hopefully work both of our red, left brain, right brain, have fun and think together and discuss at the end too. So, sounds good so far? Cool, let's dive in. Uh, so, let's get to the business first as what we can do as a company to do the right thing. So, as companies, we don't want to build products that have a popularity for a day or two. Uh, we don't want to be like that like secret. Do you, anybody, anybody remember that app, Secret, which was basically like a gossiping app for Silicon Valley? The guys made like $2 million, but now nobody remembers who they are, what they do. So nobody wants to be that. We want to build long-term remarkable relationships with our users. We want to evoke trust in them. We want to have these long-term long -term goals, whether we are startups or small-scale or large-scale companies. We want to take the risk of doing something great. And we face a lot of challenges along the way. So I would like to share a few uh, thoughts, a few uh, practices that um, helped me, helped the companies that I worked with in that journey to move from imitation to more innovation. 
So let's start with um, uh, building with intention. So by the way, like I'm hoping that you guys will enjoy my uh, gift taste. I really like this Renaissance theme gifts. Uh, it's quite hilarious. But the ultimate conflict that we always face is like making something systematic versus making something meaningful. Um, so this is where like the monetizable values start to clash with uh, meaningful experiences. And this conflict sometimes, you know, like manifests itself in these conversations various across um, disciplines. So your product manager can come and ask you about the low retention, click-through rates not going really well, and then your CEO might come and talk to you about the revenue, but as the designer, before the click-through rates, you start to think more about like, okay, is the onboarding experience not good enough? Is, are the users frustrated with some part of the experience? So before all the numbers, analytics, data, and everything, you care about the users first. You care about the um, experience that they go through. So, um, you know, those like moments of truth reveals itself when you have all these like gut checks around your priorities. So what is your priority? The click-through click rate, the revenue, or your users and delivering something good at the end. Um, and interestingly, a very little known fact is, actually we look at technology always from a very cold perspective, like yes, robots are taking over, you see all these like dystopian um, scenarios of the future where like designers don't have any jobs anymore because robots are doing it for us. But actually technology is coming from a very, very human place. So just like any word, it's also coming from Greek, shocker. Uh, so the word technology comes from um, comes from like techne, the origin uh, of the word techne and logos. And interestingly, techne actually means art, craft, skills, and um, the means by which a thing is gained. So we even when we tend to see technology as cold, putting a distance between us and um, and machines taking our taking our, over our like lives but it actually originates from this human craftsmanship place. So where we should see the technology as challenging art and art inspiring technology and the human life. Um, but first we should also define like what parts of like human life we are trying to improve, right? Like yes, we, our human life should inspire technology, technology should inspire life, but you know, let's be more specific about the parts of lives that we are, um, that we are improving. And during this journey, you know, like sometimes some companies can fall into these like buzzwords, again, the traps of like addictive or, uh, you know, like disruptive. But we already know that internet is eating up itself and the tech bubble is already facing challenges. Now, you know, like the capita is not flowing as fast as it used to compared to three, four years ago. And, um, you know, I really like this uh, quote from uh, Chris Dixon. So a product doesn't have to be disruptive. Uh, to be valuable. So there are plenty of products that are useful from day one and continue being useful because of the value that they deliver. So at the end of the day, our product shouldn't fight for attention. Uh, it should be built with intention to help people. So I read this book recently, you all know Harari's book, um, So A Brief History of Humankind. Anybody read that book? It's quite fascinating. I totally recommend you all. Uh, so he talks a lot about um, history, um, he dives into our evolution of humankind. But there is this part that really hit me when I was reading. So he was talking about this like worldly revolution and the history's biggest fraud, which he calls this as um, a bad bargain between humans and grains, which is the dom domestication of uh, wheat. So this is how like the agriculture started, but actually with agriculture um, beginning point, it also started to introduce a class system, working class and the people who are um, taking advantage of that class. And then all of a sudden we start to face long hours of work, even you know, greater risk of starvation at the end of the day too, crowded living conditions, etc., etc. So, you know, this type of revolution actually turning into a bargain between um, us and the grains, agriculture, in the sense in today's world, I kind of think of that as a bargain between us and the technology and the machines. So, um, you know, now I'm living in Germany, so I feel like I have to quote a German um, philosopher. <laughs> 
and German history is full of all these like thinkers and um, really, really great historians. So, um, anybody familiar with the story of um, Faust? So, this like bargaining story reminded me of um, Faust and how Faust was ready to uh, give his soul, um, exchange his soul for knowledge and for information with the devil. So you see this conversation here between Faust and the devil, where like Faust with this greed for information, he's just ready to give up anything. So does this, does this remind you anything with the relationship that we have with data, with this like hunger for information, but the things that we also compromise on the side? But then from a role-playing perspective, are we become, becoming the devil now because we are the technology makers? And if that's the case, like, do we want to be that devil? And, you know, I like the fact that from, um, from a designer perspective, we should talk about the purposes, the goals, and the intentions rather than, this is what we want to do. This is a solution. Take it or leave it. It should always be like, okay, this is what we are going to do, but why? So, all right, let's also talk about something that, um, that has also become a buzz, but there's a reason why it's a buzz, because it sort of speaks for, its, for itself as a truth. We have to fail. We have to fail a lot to learn from our mistakes, to, um, to come back again, stand back again, and continue with these failures as, um, as rewards for bigger success in the future. And I'm a little, bit, a little bit of a history nerd, and when it comes to ancient Roman history, I believe it's full of these like, stories of like, failures and how they are turning into successes, especially in the military stories. So there is this battle of Arosio, uh, the defeat of ancient Roman Empire um, against the German tribes. And um, you know, this is one of the ancient Rome's like, biggest, biggest defeat in its history. But it was also a very big like, turning point uh, in world history where, you know, due to a like, series of like, unpredictable uh, weather conditions, uncertain outcomes and ambushes, um, the military not um, being big enough, sort of like, stretched out a little like, too thin across the board, Romans lost. But during this loss, they used this failure as a way to also reorganize sort of see where they were losing and see like, you know, the weather conditions and um, prepare themselves for the future even better. And, oppose, and apart from all these, this defeat also gave Roman um, one of the biggest generals of its, of its history, which is Maximus, maybe you guys know from the movie too. So, you know, the struggles and um, outcomes, these are all like sound familiar, right? Like we also face these like struggles along the way in our work too. But at the end, you know, the software design journey, software development journey will always be like that. Lots of fails, lots of mistakes, but always staying resilient at the end and uh, continue moving on. So anybody remember this little guy? <laughs> right, right. Now this is like a touring test for millennials in the room. Um, but, you know, when it first came out, it was very successful. I mean, let's be real, it was game-changing. It was popping up when, even when you didn't know you needed it, it was always there for you. Like, hey, like, you want me to, you know, help you with this Word document? Like, is there something that you are confused about? And then over time, it started to get a little annoying, right? Like, it started to get a little too disruptive, always sort of, like, injecting itself in the experience when you don't need sometimes. And then now, you start to see it's becoming cool again. Everybody's trying to build the next Clippy. Maybe in the AI form, maybe in the artificial intelligence form, maybe it's in the bot form, maybe it's in the chat slash comment form, whatever it is. Everybody's working on the next form of intelligence. So the way we came to this is also through all these like mistakes. Like yes, like Clippy was great and then it failed, but it sort of paved the ground for all of us now to build that like foundation for digital assistance. And now you see these traces even in Cortana too, in Microsoft's artificial, artificial intelligence today, where Cortana anticipates the user's needs and semantically analyzing all this data across your agenda, across your email and your 
um, calendar and everything and try to help you navigating all these complex systems uh, of data and understanding experiences. So, you know, thanks to these lessons of cool, uncool, cool, oh wait, uncool again, oh cool again, now we are constantly revolutionizing the way we look at intelligence and algorithms and technologies around us. All right, let's continue more about, um, you know, this is where things get a little like interesting because we're going to talk a little about our brains now and how we are evolved to be this way, but unfortunately we have creative biases. It's it's quite like ironic because when you ask companies or creative institutions, they always want to have creativity, right? Like creativity is always an asset for them. But guess what? They're also very scared of creativity because outside of the box thinking always bring risks. Even on, on the education level, like teachers are not always comfortable with the kids that think outside the box because they are disrupting the class, they are always asking questions that other kids don't sometimes like think about and then all of a sudden the conversation in the class is totally like changing in another direction and then teachers secretly, unconsciously, are the research is also showing that too, are feeling uncomfortable around these creative, thing, uh, creative kids. So, you know, why this is the case? But, you know, the challenge is not ending here, like chemically, and evolution, evolutionary speaking, our brains wired to be that way. Our brains are one of the most like, complex organs um, in our body that actually consumes the biggest energy. And to preserve energy, brain is always constantly looking for shortcuts. Shortcuts in terms of um, what is familiar, what is known, what is comfortable, so that the brain can save all that energy and go to the, go to the outcome without thinking, without consuming itself too much. So, you know, this is crazy, right? Like, we are all craving to be creative, but the society that we are living in, and, you know, even our body is working against us. And it doesn't end over here. Our challenges is not just this. Also, the world is going nuts, right? I just show you the orange man. I mean, we can, we can get into a nuclear war. There is the, you know, the crime rate is going all like crazy high. There is the scarcity of resources. Now, you know, who knows? We might be running out of bacon soon. I mean, that's the end of the world to me. So, you know, when all these things are happening, when things are quite uncertain for us, it's hard to be creative, right? It's hard to sort of release ourselves from all these like stress and again like I'm having a really hard time understanding this right because we came such a long way from you know all these like times like 19th century was the industrial economy 20th century was the consumer economy and you want 21st century to be the creative economy right but so you know how can we how can we pass all these like challenges and truly um, apply our knowledge, our creativity towards innovation. So to be able to get there, we have to embrace this, this novelty and this way of thinking as a company. These are sort of like the principles that we put together at Foursquare, for example. It's, it took us a lot of time to get to this point, but it helped us a lot, even on, a, and on, on an unconscious level, to repeat ourselves. We are here to invent the future. We are here to make things that are delightful, that are exciting, that are engaging for our users. We are proud, but we are always continuing to fight and all these like great principles. And we also made sure they were visible everywhere. Because the, the way, the more tangible you make things for people, the more faith that you create in everybody because you sit there, you see it, you are in a meeting, you look at that at the wall and you know, it starts to um, encourage people to feel uh, more safe around creativity. And it's really, really, really important. Any organization that designs a system will inevitably produce a design whose structure is also a copy of that organization's communication structure. So you want to build great products, build a great future, great culture in your company first, and then other things will obviously follow. So this is where I start to talk and nerd a lot about how to give the design seat at the table. We talk a lot about this, but design is the discipline that is fearless compared to other disciplines where 
we talk about this like energizing creative culture for the users. And as Conway's law already puts it so clearly, a well-designed um, system will open up the gates for great products, and it's that simple. Um, well, now let's also talk about the human side of our companies. As I said, building that culture in your, in your company is more, is more important than the technology, so champion the people before you champion your technology. Um, and how do we get there? Little things add to your philosophy. At Foursquare, for example, again, like super nerdy, but we have this plus plus contributions every Friday, which we also call it like a good karma. So we give little shout outs to people from sales to support to engineering to product management to designers, whatever they do. You crushed your support tickets today. You did an amazing job with that sales. You solved this like edge case that we haven't really thought of before. So all these little good karma well, the idea is basically just like giving shout out to people, making feel good about themselves, good about their work, that contribute to the overall culture. And, you know, this is one of my, one of my biggest drives in my career now, um, diversity and inclusion. Um, this is what we do at Foursquare too, uh, we used to do, I mean, they still have it, but I'm not a part of it, unfortunately. Uh, but a diversity group, a diversity working group, uh, where we worked to cultivate a diverse culture and an inclusive culture. We also recruit um, diverse talent for the company and also help shape the future of the STEM, also in the city too, in New York City. We did um, fellowships with the mayor, we brought in um, children, we brought in high school students to our, com to our company where we taught them how to code, how to design. So we were trying to reach out to um, you know, organizations, institutions, not working only internally in our company but outside, just to spread the consciousness for how diversity is a great asset for innovation. So. You know, you have to put this in your mind, in your heart, and make sure you build this culture that is knitted in the DNA of the city, the company, the or country, because this is how we shape a good future for everybody. And at Microsoft, we have a similar um, initiative too. Uh, we have a diversity channel, for example, on Slack, where we talk about how to make workplace safe, fun, and engaging for everybody. Because we know that company priorities are important, but the first priority is the people. And, um, you know, we are designing software products that are reaching out to millions and millions of people. So if you don't appreciate the multiple, the various perspectives of people in your company, how are you going to build products that care about other people, that serve for millions of people out there? So um, the way should always be keep your people engaged, motivated, appreciated and valued uh, to be able to learn, grow and lead as a company. So these, are, these were sort of like the anecdotes and uh, my experiences within companies, but now I kind of want to take a deep breath, maybe we can all do, because now we're going to jump to the second chapter, where we talk about how to do the right thing, how to talk the talk, walk the walk as a design team. Um, and, you know, we all want to be a good agent of change, right? So we also have our own priorities too. We should have our own priorities as a design team. So let's start with designing for trust. So like I said in the beginning, we all want to build these remarkable products that build long-term relationships with their users. And as we want to achieve this long-term relationship, it should start with earning trust. Um, well, trust can be a magical word. I mean, we use that in our relationships too, right? I want you to trust me. You should be able to trust me. I want to trust you. You know, all these like human relationships, we use this a lot. But it's also from a brain processing perspective. Like trust is not easy to process, right? It's not like looking at somebody's mathematical capability and say like, yes, you are great at maths. But, you know, you cannot measure if somebody's trustworthy that easily. So that kind of decision should also be made in your decision making when you're purchasing a service, when you're, um, when you're experiencing a product, a service too. So, and, um, you know, interestingly, the way brain um, 
brain processes trust or uh, create that like re reaction to trust is also interesting. It's a complex process, but it also hits the pleasure center of uh, people's brains. So when you find somebody or something that is trustworthy, you're also automatically happy. So build trustworthy products, you also hit the jackpot because your users will take pleasure out of that product too. Um, and you know, bottom line for Wunderlist, um, which is a to-do list making productivity app. For us, the bottom line for this to evoke trust in our users was the technology. The fact that we can hold your data um, with high security and you know that your data will always be available, will be synced across all these devices. So you can jump from your mobile phone to your tablet to your desktop, your data will always be there because we got your back. So within the technology, within the sync advanced technology, we try to create that trust relationship between us and, the, um, and the, our user base. And for, um, you know, for, for, for Wunderlist, it was a technology. For Foursquare, the trust was driven by the content. So now I'm gonna talk to you guys more about the challenges with the content. Um, when I say content, I mean more like the tips, ratings, so when you're looking at a restaurant page, when you're looking at a venue page, uh, we had a lot of problems around like people always thinking like, is this review legit? Or is it written by like somebody for like five cents somewhere across the world where they were not even at that place? Or the owner of the place is opening up all these like fake accounts and then they are writing good reviews about themselves. So we had to overcome that challenge of trust or like lack of trust. And in this, in this way, we start to think as like designers, engineers, product managers, we start to think about this like communication channel. Okay, how can we create this this like legitimacy around this review. So we came up with the rating system. So you know people can rate things, give them thumbs up, thumbs down, so that you will understand there are people supporting the, that content. So now you look at a tip and it has you know X number of likes, then you start to understand like, okay, other people's eyes and ears and hearts have touched on that content. That kind of gives this like genuine feeling, that like legit feeling on that tip. So you know through through the content type, through the communication channel, and supporting the system, we were able to overcome that. Um, all right, so now it's again like getting, um, getting more like exciting, where we talk a little bit about getting out of our comfort zone and poking the bear. So what I mean by that? Um, now design, you know, everybody, everybody's look at us and talks about, oh, you guys are like pushing pixels, making things pretty, you make things beautiful, but it's much more than that, right? Like design is moving from aesthetics to more designing the society and um, thinking more about ethics and ethical challenges. So we need to realize, you know, there's a huge ethical component in what we do. And, um, you know, ethics for us shouldn't be just a hus hustle, side hustle. Mike Monteiro talks um, really beautifully about this like you know it shouldn't be just like us helping nonprofits on our weekend or on our like free time we go and do all these like volunteer work no ethics also start in your day-to-day -day job too it should be a part of how you push your pixel it should be a part of how you draw your user flows you think about your interaction stories so you know we need to think like ethically about our jobs and rec recognize um, you know, our like processes, we should start building empathy for our users and design for inclusion and for good. So, you know, I will talk more about that in a, in a minute too, but there are certain things that as designers we don't take into account. Like what? Like accessibility. It has been such an uncool notion for us, concept for us. Even I am like embarrassingly thinking when I look back at my career, I didn't think much about accessibility. I was mostly focusing on yes, that color looks really amazing on my interface and I'm going to go with that color. But is it, does it have the right contrast ratio for visually disabled people or people, people with uh, certain um, disabilities? Um, and you know, now I want to talk about a couple of different um, stories. So this is uh, Sakib Shaikh. Um, so he lost his sight when he was seven. 
And last year, uh, he teamed up with a group of designers and engineers at Microsoft to build an app um, that tells you um, who and what's around you. So what it does, it's, it's based on uh, Microsoft Intelligence API, uh, where they let you translate faces, emotions around you, and um, it reads out all those emotions and faces out in text. So with this advanced technology and design, the experience is becoming indistinguishable from magic. So seriously, it's becoming, just like Arthur C. Clarke used to uh, describe, um, you know, like good advanced technology should be indistinguishable from um, magic. So this is where our passion to design inclusive experiences, delightful and um, beautiful experiences transform into a mission to improve people's lives. So when we are enjoying these pixels, we should also enjoy that pure pleasure of helping people that are in need. Um, so our label, our labor, our work, will always have repercussions. Uh, from the color choices that we make to the in keyboard interactions that we create, our labor will always touch on human life. And it will touch in remarkably intimate ways. And um, you know, when we have so much power in our hands, um, and as you can guess, great power comes great responsibility, um, we should take all these things into account and design our guidelines, design the way we look at work, and try to be universal. So at Microsoft, while we were designing To Do, uh, which is again a productivity tool where you can uh, keep track of your achievements, uh, we wanted to make sure, as the designers, we were the gatekeep gatekeepers for responsible, inclusive products to spread the love for accessibility and inspire also other teams while they're executing on um, delivering this promise of designing for millions. And again, before we touched any pixel, we as a design team, we sat down and talked about why are we here? What's our mission? What do we want to change in, in the world? And we start to come up with all these like principles and these values. And again, we print it all out, post, post it all across our like office just to inspire us throughout the day. And John Maeda puts it in a very beautiful way. Again, like designer's role um, will be to support the social conscious um, of the product. Uh, so you might be working with people in position of authority that might not want to just um, that might not want to slow the process by investing in accessibility because accessibility will come with a certain amount of resources, time, people, processes, tech cost. Right? I love that terminology, tech cost. Um, but this is important. This is like start seeing human diversity as as a resource too, not just your technology or your um, backend structure as your resource for better products. Um, but as designers, if we don't care about the people, if we don't see human diversity as an asset, nobody else will. So it will start with us continuing to poke the bear and make sure others are pork, poking the bear too and continue thinking above and beyond. So, all right, um, let's also talk about how to be our own bosses and own our discipline. And um, we should also all know that our product represent ourselves. So um, it also reflects our team's character. We should be opinionated if we want our company to reach to a certain design maturity. We also need to own our discipline. We have to be strong in our voice and make sure sometimes we are saying no to things. We cannot say yes to every request, every, every CEO question, uh, priority, or everything on our roadmap, right? We should first question if it's really worth doing it. And sometimes it comes with certain challenging conversations where we have to say no. Um, do I have any um, Fight Club fans in the, in the room? Anybody? All right. Do you guys remember this scene? Yeah, right? It's that like legendary porch, porch scene where, well, let's talk more about this. Um, you know, it's, so there is this part where we experience a lot this terminology we use, feature creep, right? Everybody comes and asks, like, we need this. Data is showing that. We are lacking that. We have to do this. We have to do that. And then all of a sudden, you're like, OK, but can you please give me some context before you ask me to design this? Or what, what, is, what is the underlying purpose? Can we talk about that? So to avoid feature creep, 
Um, the folks from like 37 Signals puts it in a very beautiful way. Like it should be like Fight Club. It should be like that porch scene where each future should be willing to stand on our porch for three days uh, to be able to be stay in the product. So people like products that say no. People like products because our products don't try to do everything all at once. It, it should never be one size fits all. They like our products because we don't try to please everybody and we know when to say no to things. Um, and yeah, we are, we are getting uh, closer to this chapter, but also let's talk more about something a little more like tactical. So there are times, you know, design teams bring their A game. They are pushing the, their boundaries for creativity. They are doing all these like great work, exploring new frameworks, putting a new design philosophy out there, like fluent design that we did with Microsoft this past year. And, um, and then there are times where like design team just executes. Like, have you also been there where you fixed your layers in your sketch file like three days straight? Like, maybe before you go on vacation, you want to make sure you're not embarrassed with your sketch files before you pass it to your coworker. So you just sit down and fix every typo, every layer. So there will be times when you're cranking on your, on top of your like creativity and doing, um, doing things for long term. And then there are things where you just sit down and fix your sketch files because that's what you have to do at that point and you start to become um, thinking more in tactical terms. So yes, there will be times a sense of urgency will sink in and then you will be producing style guides, component libraries and things like that. But you know that it is, it is a part of the process because you know that you invest in your future by doing this execution, by doing this production too. So it should be in the hands of the designer to have that judgment call, like when to invest in long term, when to invest in short term. And it's just like kitchen. I'm also a little bit of a sucker when it comes to food shows. I love watching all these like chefs doing, or they were doing their thing. And I see that in like Michelin star chefs too, like they, some, some days they get together with their crew and they design that like signature dish that blows everybody's freaking mind. And then some, sometimes they just spend like 20 hours cutting onions and potatoes in the kitchen. So it, it, it's pretty much what we do too in our design team. So, all right, the last but not least, um, how to drive that change and drive for the good value as, as, a, as a designer. I'm going to share uh, a few uh, of my personal journeys with you guys. So, um, curiosity. Curiosity enables us to continue our evolutionary path. Like, it really makes us ask why, right? We are here today because we constantly ask why, and all the great in inventions always start with that why. And Frank Gehry, I, I have my architect friend with me, she might like it. Uh, so Frank Gehry says, puts it in a, in a really great way, like your creativity starts with whether you're curious or not. So it is our jet fuel for curiosity. It drives success, innovation. It helps us move into these uncertain, unknown territories. We get out, get out of our comfort zone. We are always unsettled because we are curious to see if we have more, if, we, if there are new things out there that are waiting for us, if there, are, um, if there are new territories. We continue asking questions and discovering, discovering um, new things around us. And we never settle for default. We always go for out of the box because we are that creative kids that teachers used to be scared of, right? Um, so this behavior actually shows itself, manifests itself in so many, so many different ways. And any, any explorer or safari browsers in the room? I'm going to offend you guys a little bit, but please bear with me. So according to Adam Grant, the author of Originals, uh, according to him, we can predict your job performance and your commitment by knowing which web browser you use. I'm not kidding. So there is good evidence that shows, bear with me, Firefox and Chrome users significantly outperform people that use Explorer and Safari. Because what is, what is in common with Safari and Explorer? Because they come by default. So. Apparently, people using Firefox and Chrome, they stay in their jobs 15% longer. Um, and, you know, even all these like browsers have the same speed capability, the same technological uh, possibilities. 
Explorer and Safari come installed, the others, they are all like handed to you, but Chrome and Firefox, you doubt, you look for something better. Even when it's not better, at least you go through the journey of looking for it. So it's not just a par part of your personality where curiosity makes an impact on your performance, uh, but this becomes, this defines like who you are and at the end um, makes an impact on the work to search better, to look for something unique. Um, and as I said, I'm, in an, I'm coming from an industrial design background, so I have a super big crush on Dieter Rumps. Um, again, German bonus over there, both the industrial designer and German, and it fits with my background like so perfectly now. So, yes, this legendary Dieter Rumps German designer always says, um, you know, nothing works without the details. They are everything, the baseline of quality. De good design is through... Um, is thorough down to the last last detail. And, um, you know, nothing really should feel arbitrary in your work. Uh, nothing should be left to chance. So do you want to show respect for your users and put the care and accu accuracy and refine your work in your process? I'm assuming the answer is yes. So we should pay attention to every little detail because all these de little details are the design, actually. Um, let's talk about for example, the power of words and language. It's funny, you know, all these years now we have copywriting departments in our um, companies. Um, now words are becoming even more powerful. What it makes me sad when I see lorem ipsum in designs. We can do much, much better than that, right? And when language is also a piece of technology, like Mark Pagel says, um, it's also a tool for us to empower our users um, through the power of words and, uh, and language. So, interesting study. Um, according to this economist, Keith Chen, languages that don't have tenses, uh, like Mandarin and Finnish, um, that have only present tense, that cover also both present and future tense, um, it look at the present and the future equally uh, from a language perspective because of the lack of tenses. But in English, we have tenses, right? We have the present, we have the future. And um, interestingly, future tense, according to the study, future tense puts a distance uh, between us and today, and it reflects on our money-saving activities. So people, interestingly, save more money in China and in Finland because they think the future is right around the corner, because future is today, actually. But in English-speaking countries, future oh, it's days, months ahead of us, so who cares about saving the money, right? Let's just live the day. It's so, so weird when you look at the power of words and language changing the way you live your life, changing the way you save your money, the way you save your finances, your economy. Why don't we design the language also, just like we design our experiences, just like we pick the right color palettes to write like typography. So. We should, we should care about that detail too, because actually, guess what? It's not a detail anymore. It's so strong in the experience. Um, in to do, Microsoft to do, uh, it's maybe cheesy, but our mission is to make, um, is to help people become better versions of themselves. And every little detail from how you name a list, how you name, how you position um, a folder, all the naming conventions, make an impact on the user's um, productivity and their achievements. So we see that in our um, experiments too. So we start to call the very main experience my day, just to put more focus on people's minds around the day. How do you describe the day? My day is 24 hours, but most of that day you're sleeping, so there is like two there's 14, 14 hours of that day is left. So you start to become more conscious when we start to use day around how much you can do, how much you can accomplish. And we saw that in our experiments that when we start to, when we are using the my day, people are much more um, aware of what they can put in the list because they know, wait, I have only this many hours in the day, so I cannot just dump everything. So we saw that people are achieving more things because they are in this mind day mindset. And at the end, they are feeling much more productive because it's not a long list of like 30 tasks and at the end you are doing only two. 
you are putting to or for, and you're p doing all of those things during the day too. So you, it is the product is making you happy too at the end. And like another detail, another way of looking at technology. Um, so I love this experiment that they do at Facebook. They call it uh, 2G Tuesdays where they create um, more empathy um, within the company where every employee switches to uh, 2G networking to build that empathy with their users that are in developing countries. So most of the time we make all these like beautiful animations, right? We make all these beautiful interfaces, we put uh, beautiful images, but do we think about the loading? Do we think about the latency performance? Do we think about the networking? Do we think about the connection? Do we think about the location of our users? So maybe it feels like a very small detail, but again, like at the end, Facebook designers were able to see the pain their users were going through and started to build more conscious and delightful experiences for these loading, loading states or start to think more about latency. Um, all right, so Let's talk about now design being a little unique that sits in the middle of art, science, and technology. So we are all like opinionated, gutsy individuals, just like artists, right? We are also like true alchemists. Um, we put all these like creative thoughts sometimes in the art form and turn them into something more tangible. But at the same time, we are also very scientists, science-heavy people that look at data, that um, look at business goals, um, implement these like technological novelties. So we sit right in the intersection of all these various disciplines. And you see that in some companies quite clearly like Pixar, right? They are true scientists that is blended with true art. Like you look at the water reflection in a, in a movie like Finding Nemo and you see all these like details and then you watch some like TED talk of some scientist or designer that designed that animation and she talks about three months of work that goes into that little water reflection animation. So that's pure science. So how can we bring that science into our design, into our process and again blend in all those, um, all those disciplines. And, um, oh wait, I... I actually had the sound for this one. Oh no. Um, but so at Wunderlist, we um, play this like twinkling sound. Can we, can we get that? I totally forget about that. But so there's this like twinkling sound that we make when you check, um, when you check a task. So when you complete something, there's this like ding song. And interestingly, a fun fact, that ding song is based on um, C major, major seven chord. And that C major seven chord corresponds to a human emotional mood that is re reflect relaxing, but also studies show that um, it creates a feeling, it creates um, this like pure joy in people's minds when they hear the C major seven. And you know, in, the, in this case, like we see um, accomplishment, completing a task is partnered up with this with this little like sound, with this little like science that uh, brings that like happiness, that brings this cheerful experience. So science, design all together coming in and creating both a psychological effect on people while they are accomplishing something. Are you feeling more cheerful now? <laughs> right? All right. I'm going to skip now. But yeah, it was, the, it was that cheer. It was that relaxation that we aimed for. And again, like another like, fun fact about that too, they also worked on the visual, um, visual impact of that sound. And people start to see, uh, people were describing that sound as like, oh, I see children holding hands and running around. Like, how can you describe joy better than this? Um, and sciencing things is also, you know, looking at human psychology, looking at cognitive science, looking at how people's brain reacts to things, right? Like I've been talking about how our brain complex processes are also underlying um, 
reality behind our experiences and our design journey. So for us, um, you know, at Microsoft, one of the biggest promises that we make is productivity. Empowering the user to be productive, keeping them motivated, feeling them engaged, helping them boost their motivation. And when we are looking at this type of like psychology, this type of place that we want to create for our users, um, I get, I draw a lot of inspiration from um, this cognitive scientist, Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi. He has the best last name, by the way. Um, a Hungarian psychologist um, recognized and named this psychological uh, concept of flow. He calls it flow, where it's this like focused mental state of productivity. You can call it feeling in the groove, being in the zone, and this this model that he created um, was one of the biggest inspirations for us as designers working in productivity. So how can we get people into this flow, into this zone, and we start to call this like no bullshit model, but where like you see there's highest engagement, where there is low challenge, where there's medium, medium level challenge, so finding that like perfect perfect place, that like special sauce for our people, for our users to feel certain way so that we hit the right places for their productivity too and you know this is where that like science of psychology, cognition and user experience get together. Um, so as, as a successful designer we should also have a strong psychology, a strong um, mindset right because our journeys are always tough we go through these like hard days where design is still struggling to prove it, prove itself, right? That's why I was talking about designer seat. Let's let's give a seat at the table. But what does that mean? So we need to grow thick skins as designers. To at some point, we have to separate ourselves from our work. I understand we all stay up till late to get things work. We sketch things out, so many ideas, and then most of the time, you know. Some of them work, some of them don't. But, you know, growing a thick skin is important. Sometimes you have to fake it until you make it. I used to do it a lot in my agency days. Like, I'm standing in front of a client. I'm scared as shitless, but I try to fake, like, I'm the bravest person in the room so that I sort of build this, like, different persona for myself so that I can present my work in a confident way so that I can stand behind my work. But like sometimes you also have to embrace that doubt because like I said, that doubt pushes us to be curio curious, that curiosity pushes us to search for something and it's a part of the journey. And the way I look at this is also 10 step steps of, you might call it misery, but I think it's 10 steps of um, glory. But it always starts like that. We produce lots of ideas and then we think we are awesome, right? And then 90% of those ideas turn out to be shit and then you try to explain you know why you are the one designing that unlike not not your PM or your engineer you should be the designer and then you go through all these like phases of like oh my god my work is great oh no my work is really bad oh no hundred ideas okay none of them are working and then at the end at the end you find that solution and you see you know you crush that you turn um, that idea that bad idea in the beginning into gold, some innovation, and then all of a sudden you are there and um, you feel proud of yourself. And that's what we call being a designer is at the end too. Um, so, do the work that you believe in, but do it with professionalism, do it with integrity, and do it with competence. And as Tim Brown says, we cannot continue creating stories only, we also have to create movements. Because the history is full of geniuses that fell on their faces multiple times on their path to success, but they knew when to stand back. They knew how to create revolutions through these mistakes. And just like that like famous old Japanese saying uh, goes, uh, fall seven times, stand up eight. Um, so yes, we are going to fail a lot. We are going to go through that misery, but at the end, we will find our own way. We will shake things up, we will poke the bear here and there, we're gonna say, we're gonna have a lot of tough conversations, we're gonna say no sometimes, but at the end we are all doing this for our users. And at the end, we have that responsibility to do the right thing because we have to do it or nobody else will. 
Um, and yes, so thank you so much for having me, listening to me. Hope you enjoyed it. So I think we have time for questions. Any questions? No? Is it a good sign or bad? I think people are people are still thinking about the question, so let's give two three minutes and then maybe. Of course. Oh, there it is. Thanks. There's a lot to digest. That's why I think people are still catching up. Um, so um, you have a lot of interest within design, the nerdy stuff, um, data rams. Um, how do you find the time to to do all of this? Because I mean, everything you said is true, but in principle, you know, um, when there are projects, um, yeah, there's people, there's users, there's stakeholders. Um, do you have any tips on how you how you string it together? I, I can see that you have a lot of interest and identify with that by struggle to string it together. Great question. Sleeping is overrated. That's that's how I'm going to answer. No. Yeah, partially. Um, I guess like. It's also a personal technique that I think everybody should develop, like how you use your time. I struggled with that a lot in my own personal career, in my professional career, personal life. Um, but I found the magic use of calendar finally. I also recommend you guys to try this too. I block my time on my calendar, even for thinking. Like I go super anal, super organized, when it comes to like, I'm gonna block this chunk just for reading. I'm gonna block this chunk for just, you know, talking to my teams, talking to my colleagues. And like, even in the evening for like outside of work hours too, like I have all these like lists and reminders for myself. Like, this is the time you should check the news for this blog or whatever, like this is the time when they release like the updates during, during that day, like things like that. So I try to be very organized on my calendar um, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a journey, it's an experience. You have, to, you have to find like what works for you. Like there are, I start to do meditation a lot, that helps me a lot just to focus. I s used to struggle a lot with distraction because again, like so many thoughts, right? Like you're a designer, you're inspired by like all these different things, but like meditation helps a lot to clear your thoughts and be much more focused. I used to read the same article like three times because of that distraction, but you know, it's helping me a lot. So I would say caffeine in the morning, meditation in the morning, uh, you know, six, eight hours sleep, but be very, very organized on your calendar and like make sure you are using your time like wisely and like in the office, like it's so easy to again, you know, dive into some like fountain, the coffee uh, machine like talk, but try to also use that for inspiration to like bring some like articles or like, you know, share things with your coworkers and try to push people's buttons and try to learn from people too because yeah, like my team always inspired me, the people that I work with. Um, so, yeah. Does that answer your question? How can this side lose out? I mean, that the side they already asked the question. So, you have more people this side. Oh, you have a question, sorry. Uh, you mentioned a lot of, but <clears throat> you mentioned that you are very involved in diversification, di diversity. So, could I just check with you, how do you go about handling conflicts in a diverse environment because 
there are situations where some of your colleagues may come from different cultures, yet when conflict arises, some of them get very passive aggressive and don't really say anything until like it blows up or so how will you actually go about handling that? I think like the biggest part is listening. So first creating a safe place for people so that they can speak openly, honestly about their problems, about um, the issues and then listening really carefully and making sure you are also being genuine towards people because now diversity is something that everybody talks about and sometimes you see the diversity efforts are just for sake of the effort not necessarily coming from a true place but make sure you know you're showing that like value towards people like what we do for example at like foursquare and at microsoft too we have also hours where we just talk about this. We rotate also, um, also like issues. Like for example, a couple of weeks ago, we did an issue creating um, inclusion for people that are working remotely. You know how it is when you're on a Skype call, you have sometimes technical challenges, there's sometimes delay, or there's always this like, fear of like cutting somebody off because you're not in the room, so you're not necessarily, you know, like getting the vibe, the energy in the room. And it excludes people and we don't have enough empathy for people. And like when we talk about like diversity, it's also like diversity in you remote, I'm not remote. Or like, you know, you're using this technology, I'm using that technology. Like how can we bridge all these like, um, all these gaps? So for that, we make sure we have the um, acknowledgement, we acknowledge the problem, we get together, we talk about the problem, and we create that space. Like for that hour, this is just what we talk about. And we are not going to leave this room until we have a solution for that. And you know, somebody taking notes, somebody sharing the uh, outcomes, and we are taking the serious steps at the end too. Like conflict is inevitable, like conflict on every level, in every situation, but it's about listening to each other. Like there is this experiment, they call it the green chair and the yellow chair. So sometimes when you take yourself out of the equation, you, like each chair actually like represent a different opinion. Like green chair is somebody with one opinion and the yellow chair is somebody with another opinion. But you take the people out of the equation and you just um, give room and like space like so you're not a part of the scenario anymore, so that kind of gives you the objectivity that you were lacking previously. And then you start to analyze the situation without, uh, without yourself in it. So it gives you more perspective and more respect. So those kind of like techniques and the space and getting together and being open towards like one another, it's, it's really important. So I think everybody should invest in a community like that. People that are feeling passionate about the subject should get together, even in a startup, even in a small place, because this is something that we should all care about and um, yeah, spare time for and um, make sure we also make the executive level listen to us to listen to what we care about. Because also research shows innovation happens when you when you care more about diversity. Hi, uh, okay, to stay on the topic of diversity, and I have a question specifically about data, because um, data is something that increasingly we try to use a lot, but then when you try to use data in diversity, you run into a big problem, because diversity is always about minority groups, minority languages, minority browsers or, or te technology systems which actually may be related to socioeconomics and stuff like that as you mentioned. Um, and sometimes I find that a lot of perspectives that come out of you know, an interest in diversity find it very difficult to take part in the conversation when there's data involved. Even I, I'm a PM and I have a rule with my team. If there's no data, I'm not going to listen. So find your data. So how, what are some strategies perhaps if you have them um, for bringing data into conversations about diversity? Hmm. Actually, even the fact that um, even the fact that there are more CEOs that have the name John than women CEOs in the world, that's the data for you, just to underline how big the problem is. I think data is not the challenge. Data is actually the biggest supportive 
in our argument, just to make sure people are listening to us, we have the voice in the room. Like, it's, it's very drastic when you look at, for example, the, um, the salary gap, right, between men and women. That's data for you that you have to um, use to contribute to your argument. So I don't necessarily see that as, like, how to um, make sure these are, like, heard, but it's actually, like, use the data on your advantage to make even a stronger point. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But I think now, like, data science is, we are doing a lot of um, these, like, studies inside and outside of big companies, too. I mean, sometimes, yes, transparency is becoming an issue. Like, Google, for example, didn't want to share the data with the salaries, right? So, but, again, the reality, the fact that they were not sharing it was showcasing the problem on its own, so I think that's already helping us to move forward with this agenda, even with a, with a stronger voice. So I wouldn't be fear, fearful of bringing data, I would bring even more data. Hi, uh, my name is Yvonne, thank you for the inspiring talk. Um, I'm just curious because like, we are all designers here and you are talking a lot about accessibility, diversity, inclusiveness, but I am worried that we are like, somehow in our own like, echo chamber. We are all very idealistic people, so I'm wondering if you have any tips on how we can get other people outside of our circle to care more mm -hmm. about this issue. Mm -hmm. Well, like, the main argument that I always make at Microsoft is like, you are designing for these people, so you have to be mindful of their pain points. And bring in researchers, bring in the data, bring in the user insights, also like help to just people, just to make people aware of the situation. So, um, you know, like accessibility is also an asset for companies to become much more known for within the industry because not every company is investing in it. So I encourage companies to work in this field even more so that like, don't you become, don't you want to become the reference point? Don't you want, don't you want to be that like example that everybody's like pointing out? So like there is, there is some beauty of uh, working in this and being that company that invests in it because you will make um, you will create that like um, image for the company that is inclusive, that is thoughtful, that is strong, so that this will contribute again like to their like success. Like yes, it will take time, but at the end, not enough companies are doing it. So when you do it, you you sort of stand out in the crowd, and like that uniqueness, that personality helps you build an identity for the company that sort of like helps them um, to be even like more successful. So I, I sort of make that argument to, for the company to um, create that persona, create that personality because companies care about their image, maybe from a selfish perspective, but that's what it is at the end of the day. And if you want that image, like you have to invest in this. And again, it will return to you as more users too. So if you're, if you're talking to a CEO about this, like, hey, give me more researchers, give me more time and resources to invest in this, just tell them that, like, two things. Your company will look much better in the industry because, you know, maybe that's a selfish uh, incentive. But if we're going to look much better in, in, the, in the industry, everybody will look up to us. And second, we will have more users because people with disabilities are looking for services out there. Like, they are settling for such crappy experiences and they don't have to. And when you design something good, they will know you, they will discover you, and they will come after you. So, you speak to a larger audience and more users, that's something every company would die for. And I, I don't think companies should be so scared of accessibility. There's already so much data out there and so much, like, open source libraries, for example, to check your contrast ratio in your designs or, 
you know, how to enable like keyboard navigations. Sometimes all these also come like by default in the OS and the operating system level. So there is actually very little that you have to do from a technology implementation perspective. Uh, thanks for a very interesting presentation. Uh, perhaps building on the, <clears throat> on the gentleman's question just now, uh, is there ever a situation where <clears throat> it's better to design for the minority than for the majority? Let's say, for example, features A shows that a lot of people want it, right? And then you've got feature B. But feature B doesn't show a lot of, I mean, doesn't, the data doesn't show that a lot of people need it. Would there be a situation <clears throat> where it's actually, that you actually, it's better for you to design feature B? Hmm. Interesting. Well, like, actually, the way I see the driverless cars, that's the perfect use case, like, where you also design for the minority, where people with disabilities can also easily take care of themselves without somebody else's support, right? Like, I was looking at this project from, like, Virginia Tech, for example. They built the whole technology for people with visual disabilities, a car that the visually disabled people can actually drive too because the whole interface is designed with haptic feedback. There is like a Google Maps type of thing where the navigation is through air, air um, pipes. So you kind of like feel the topography on your hand. So it kind of gives you the direction for where to go. So like designing for a minority also unlocks like certain technologies. Like they, they had this the problem started with how can we create a navigation system for visually disabled? And then they went after and found the right technologies, right mediums, right tools to design something. So now, you know, they are writing scientific papers about it because that's an invention. They did, they, I think they call it like air picks or something. Um, so yeah, like when you were designing for the minority, it also unlocks like new territories, new technologies and like pushes us to the new territories, to like new, um, new advances, new adva advancements. Does it answer your question? Okay, it looks like there are no more questions. So thanks a lot for so much energy after flying in all the way from Germany uh, this morning. Uh, yeah, please clap. <laughs> But this is a little...